It's been 10 years since we were introduced to Black Ops. Black Ops Cold War drops us directly into the depths of Cold War in 1981. After meeting with the Secretary of State's Alex Haig and President of the United States Ronald Reagan, CIA operative Russell Adler is tasked to hunt down Soviet agent Perseus to prevent an attack on the free world. Adler assembles an elite team of operatives including Alex Mason, Frank Woods, Jason Hudson, Gregory Weaver, Lawrence Sims, Elazar, Lazar, Azuli, Bell and Adler's partner Helen Park. In this video we're diving in depth on Alex Mason, Frank Woods and Gregory Weaver. Born in 1933, Alex Mason's instincts began to take shape in the harsh wilderness of Alaska where he honed his firearm skills hunting with his father. He eventually enlisted in the United States Marine Corps where his sharpshooting abilities made him a standout recruit. In 1958, after serving a highly respected terms of service with the Marines, his undeniable talents, reckless behavior and fervent beliefs led his path into the dangerous world of the CIA's Special Activities Division where the original storyline began to take shape. On that cloudy morning of April 17, 1961, Operation 40, a team of CIA operatives including Alex Mason, Joseph Bowman and Frank Woods, arrived on Cuba to carry out Operation Zapata, just as the Bay of Pigs invasion was unfolding. That invasion provided a much needed diversion as the team raided a compound where Fidel Castro was thought to be assassinated by Mason himself. Unfortunately for the team, Mason was captured by Cuban military during their escape and in a twist we didn't see coming, well some of us may have seen it, was immediately handed over by the real Fidel Castro to Soviet General Nikita Dragovich. Mason was then thrown into the infamous labor camp in Forkuta where he was progressively brainwashed in an attempt to turn him into a sleeper agent to carry out Dragovich's plans. As we know now, the scheme may not have gone exactly according to plan. On October 6, 1963, with the help of his new friend Viktor Reznov, Mason set in motion an elaborate prison break from Forkuta and made his way back to the United States. Within a month of his return, Mason set out on a mission to sabotage the Soviet space program and take out Dragovich, the order of President John F. Kennedy. And so began Operation Flashpoint. On November 17, 1963, CIA field operatives Mason, Woods, Brooks and Bowman infiltrated the Soviet Cosmodrome in Baikonur, Kazakhstan to eliminate members of the Ascension Group, rescue Special Agent Grigory Weaver and gather intel on Dragovich. Although Weaver lost an eye to Dragovich's second-in-command, the sadistic colonel Lev Kravchenko, Mason and Woods successfully extracted Weaver, sabotaged the launch site and continued their pursuit of Dragovich. Five years later, in early 1968, Mason joined the Studies and Observations Group SOG, unit to investigate covert Soviet activity in Laos and Cambodia, leading to the discovery of the existence of a chemical weapon called Nova 6, originally created by Dr. Friedrich Steiner. After escaping capture in Laos with Woods in tow, Mason headed to Rebirth Island on February 23, 1968, to find and kill Steiner, with United States forces also en route to prevent his death. Of course, by the time they arrived, the damage had already been done. After the events on Rebirth Island, Mason was taken into custody and interrogated by CIA Special Agent Jason Hudson, revealing the harrowing experience leading up to his questioning. With various truths revealed and mysteries solved, Mason and Hudson raced to the Soviet ship Brzalka to prevent the release of deadly Nova 6 payload and finally kill Dragovich, putting an end to the crisis in a spectacular display of fearlessness and quick thinking. Little did they know the challenges to come in the near future. Fast forward to January 8, 1981, Mason receives an unexpected phone call from Hudson who wants to get the old team back together. If Mason will return as a CIA operative, he is to immediately report to Amsterdam to rendezvous with his former partner, Sergeant Frank Woods, alongside with the mysterious operative Russell Adler. As it turns out, a covert mission to end the Iran hostage crisis would end up revealing a far greater threat. Born on March 20th, 1930, Frank Woods has been a dyed-in-the-wool rebel ever since his early years. 
He ran away from his Philadelphia home as a young child, never to return to the life he once knew. Getting by on his street smarts and razor sharp instincts would quickly learn to depend on no one but himself for survival. After enlisting in the United States Marine Corps, Woods gained an extensive amount of fighting experience throughout the Korean War and afterwards became a sergeant in the MACV SOG during the Vietnam War. One can only imagine the reputation he earned in combat which eventually led him to joining the CIA's Special Activities Division. On April 17, 1961, Woods teamed up with the CIA operatives Alex Mason and Joseph Bowman on a covert mission in Santa Maria, Cuba to assassinate Fidel Castro. Fearless and impulsive, Woods led the team in their raid on Castro's building where Mason was thought to have successfully executed Castro. Was a failure upon discovering their target was a body double, Woods was able to successfully extract himself and Bowman while Mason was captured at the hands of Soviet General Nikita Dragovich. Following Dragovich's trails, Woods partnered up again with Mason five years later in Vietnam, where they met CIA Special Agent Jason Hudson to track down a Soviet defector suspected of holding key information about Dragovich's master plan. The Studies and Observations Group SOG unit was then led to Laos, where they discovered a shot down Soviet cargo plane carrying Nova 6 gas, only to be captured before they could report their findings. In one of the most intense confrontations in Black Ops history, Woods, Mason and Bowman were forced by their captors to gamble with their lives in a game of Russian Roulette. Though Bowman didn't make it out alive, Woods and Mason were able to stage a last minute escape thanks to Woods' unstoppable survival instincts. After stealing a helicopter and making their way to Kravchenko's compound, the two soldiers confronted Kravchenko in a bloody fight, ending with Woods and Kravchenko falling out of a window. Both men were presumed dead following an explosion just moments later. But as we all know, you can't kill Frank Woods. Over a decade later, on January 13, 1981, in Traps on Turkey, Woods learns about a legendary Soviet operative whose existence has been questioned even within the deepest ranks of the CIA. Within a matter of weeks, he joins a newly assembled team tasked with tracking down this dangerous figure at any cost. And the next chapter of his story begins. According to Weaver's CIA dossier, he was born in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on November 10, 1936. His father was a local political figure who was killed during Stalin's Great Purge and his mother defected to the United States during the Second World War. Weaver was assigned to infiltrate Dragovich's launch facility and disable the rockets that is set to launch at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the USSR. However, before he could do that, he was compromised and captured by Dragovich's second-in-command, Kravchenko. Later, Woods and Mason spotted him via a pair of binoculars. He was tied to a chair and interrogated near an MI8. Kravchenko then called Woods on the radio and told him that he would be spared only if they surrendered. When Mason and Woods do not comply, Kravchenko buries a knife into Weaver's eye and moves him into the nearby building where he was eventually rescued by Mason. After the Baikonur mission, Weaver develops a bond with Woods and Mason for saving his life. However, Mason's deteriorating mental condition has caused a rift in the friendship from worry to mistrust and by February 1968, Weaver was convinced that Mason is burnt during the latter days in Furkuda and advises Hudson to deal with Mason with two in the chest, one in the head, thus deeming him unfit to continue any further operations. After Mason and the SOG unit recovered a file from Soviet defector that had intel on Dragovich, they discovered a man named Daniel Clark had helped create Nova 6. Weaver and Hudson were sent to Kowloon to interrogate him. Afterwards, he revealed that he was working on Nova 6 for Dragovich and that the Nazi scientist named Steiner was also involved pertaining to the experiment. The group was then forced to flee across Kowloon City after an attack by Soviet Spetsnaz infantry. Shortly before reaching the LZ, a slippery roof causes Clark to fall and hang from Hudson's arm. Before he can reveal important information about Nova 6, Clark is shot through the head. Weaver and Hudson continue and are eventually rescued by other CIA agents. They immediately head to the Soviet Union to retrieve Steiner. Weaver, Hudson, Brooks and Harris traveled to the Yamantau complex stake on waves of Soviet troops in the blizzard with support from Blackbird piloted by Captain Mosley and Major Knights using elements of stealth to keep themselves hidden. Harris falls to his death when the bridge he is standing on is crippled by an RPG forcing Weaver, Hudson and Brooks to parachute from the cliff to escape the resulting avalanche. Failing to locate Steiner they discover the location of Dragovich's targets Steiner contacts the CIA and reveals his location at Rebirth Island, and that only he could translate the number codes. 
It is revealed that Mason, who they thought died in Vietnam, was alive and had set out with Reznov to kill Steiner. Weaver, Hudson and the CIA reach Rebirth Island, fighting through waves of Spetsnaz through clouds of weaponized Nova 6. Upon reaching the base, they see Mason attacking Steiner on the other side of a bulletproof window. A delusional Mason proclaims that he himself is Viktor Reznov and that he will have his revenge. Once through the glass, Mason shoots both Steiner and Weaver but Hudson knocks him out. Weaver suggests that they find Reznov but Hudson says they won't because he was never there. Upon the revelation that Reznov was never on the island, it is accepted that Mason is the only link to finding the broadcast station. He is then taken into custody and interrogated by the CIA. Following Steiner's death, Weaver and Hudson interrogate Mason for the location of the number station. When he tells them he doesn't know what they're talking about, they put him through major events in his life from Bay of Pigs in 1961 to the present day. However, Hudson does most of the interrogating, getting few answers out of Mason, who rants on about Dragovich, Kravchenko, Steiner and his delusions concerning Reznov. Later, Weaver gives up and tells Hudson they're at DEFCON 2 and need to get to the bunker. Hudson chooses to stay in a last-ditch effort to jog Mason's memory. Weaver tells Hudson it's his choice if he wants to die with him and walks out. However, Hudson does jog Mason's memory and finds out that Castro gave Dragovich a ship called the Rosalka, which was the number station. They clear out the ship, but find out the Broska station is really underneath it in a supply station. Hudson calls in the airstrike, but Mason insists they go after Dragovich. Once Hudson agrees, he tells Weaver to take the rest of the squad out. After the attack on the Rosalka and Dragovich's death, Weaver declares victory, but Mason reminds him that they are only the winners for now. Thank you guys very much for watching. The creation of these videos is very time consuming, from writing the script to designing the motion graphics. So if you like these types of video and want to support me in continuing creating, there are several things you can do. Liking or disliking, depending on what you thought of the video. Other than views, this shows me how much you like the content I put out. Subscribing reinforces your support and shows me you want more videos. Leaving interactive comments or feedback reminds me how I'm not just doing it for myself and shows how I can improve. And the last way to support me is to join the channel and become a member for one, five or ten dollars. In return you will unlock exclusive rewards such as digital lore items and exclusive posts or perhaps unique ideas you can implement. The more support I gain, the more time and energy I can invest in YouTube and in turn this will result in more frequent uploads and higher quality content. Whatever you decide to do, I'll be here because I like what I do. Thanks again for watching, peace out.